so the way I'm going to take this program is, um, I think we're going to run through body practical. While I'm explaining, at a point that we need to, we have to switch, switch from um, the PowerPoint to Excel presentation. So I will show, demonstrate one or two things there. Then we will move on to. Okay, so I'll be alternating my screens here. I'm actually finding difficult to see. Let me see. Share screen. Okay, I think my, my slide is up now, right? Yes, I can see the slide. Okay, yeah, fine. So, I can start. We are good to go. So, good evening once more. Um, let me see. Okay, yeah, fine. So, let me not come for this um, session with you. One, at the end of this session, um, participants should be able to identify the complete set of financial statements, identify other um, information sources for financial statement analysis. Um, attendees should be able to analyze um, companies' financial results, make um, cross company comparison, identify quality issues that may exist in financial, the reported financial statements, and discern evidence of financial. So, we should bear these key things in mind while we, uh, we go through this presentation today. So, starting with financial, the set of financial statements, okay? So, basically, if you look at I, um, IS1, that's where you, you see the outline of this. First, we have the cost statement, which um, shows the financial performance of an entity within a particular period, right? So it could be for um, for three months, for six months, or for one, for nine months, or for one year. Um, so this shows the day-to-day -day activity and how the operating condition of the business is, whether they're profit or loss making, essentially. For statement of financial position, that shows the resources that um, at the entity's disposal. So um, from at the, in this statement, you can see the asset, which is the resources and how those resources are, are being funded, whether through equity or liabilities or combinations of those. Or the cash flow statement, um, that shows the, the flows in that, for that business. So the cash flow statement, by the time we move um, into those analyses, we see that the cash flow is subdivided into three categories. We have the operating cash flow, the investing cash flow, and the financing. For changes in equity, that shows changes in shareholders' equity. My disclosure note now should, um, highlights more insight, throws more insight into other element of the financial statement. So now we start for financial, financial statement analysis, it's always good to look at it from a broad, a broad based perspective, a spectrum. So for example, you may be looking at five years historical figures, seven years or 10 years. So you could be able to analyze trends. Um, so moving forward, these are at least these are a complete set of financial statements everyone should know. Um, so other information sources you need while analyzing financial statement. One is the annual report. So in the annual report, you still have the financial statements in there, the chairman's um, report, management commentaries, and even information about business. <laughs> for you to bring out the quality and, and analysis, be able to at least have a basic um, knowledge about what that business is all about. Then the auditor's report is uh, quite important to financial statement analysis, right? So if if um, the numbers you are you are trying to analyze does not portray the true pro and fair view of the, the company's operation, you agree with me that you are wasting your time completely. So those information have to be credible. And for it to be credible, an auditor have to satisfy that yes, this information shows a pro and fair view for you to rely on it for financial statement analysis. Next is management discussion and, and analysis. So for every discussion and analysis, you can actually get it from different sources. One is um, the annual reports. Um, others are corporate actions on, on the exchange. Um, um, you can probably get some from the company's website. Some on daily, national daily too. Um, next is um, interim reports. So for public listed entities, they are mandated to, to publish their um, financials at least every quarterly. So that is also a useful, inform a useful source for um, information in your financial statement analysis. Next is the proxy statement distri uh, distributed to shareholders. So sometimes you see companies outlining what um, they'll put to vote at, um, in the AGM on that policy, on that proxy statement. And we we'll also see information on um, directors, compensation, and what have you. So next is the framework. 
here for prior statement analysis. So I'll be talking through this. So before we analyze, uh, you embark into an analysis, at least you have an, an, an objective or end goal you wish to achieve at the end of that analysis. So some, some, some may pick up a statement to analyze just for credits, for credit, right? So a company comes to borrow from you, 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 you want to look at their financials to see if they, they are credit worthy or if the operation will be able to, to repay back those loans. Uh, for investors to trying to have an equity stake in the company, you can equally analyze the company to see how profitable they are or how their future prospect looks like. Even for employees too, when you are taking on employment with a company, you won't like a company that once you go in today, the next day, you have been told that the company is going bankrupt or something. So you probably we, we, we want to look into those financials to see if you if there is a long-term prospect for you in such a company. So there are various things at, in in which way you, you should undertake um, an analysis of financial statement. So the number one objective before embarking on any analysis is for you to articulate your purpose, all right, and have a context at, um, within which you should actually approach that financials. So I would say that the next is um, uh, you, you, you now have to collect data, right? So what are the data sources available to you? Definitely the financial statement is one. Then where can you get this financial statement? So you can get financial statement. One is from the company's website. Right. Most companies host their financial information on their website. Um, your next um, point of call should be the exchange. If, if it's a publicly listed company, right, you go to the exchange where it's being listed. Oh, Normally, they also find their returns with the exchange. Um, if you can't get it there, let's say it's a private company, then probably you need to approach the company secretary or you write to the corporate affairs commission. Because most of them are mandated to the qualifying returns with the, with the bodies. Um, so your next is you, you process those data, which is uh, why we are here today. So I'll show you how you could make sense out of these numbers being reported. Um, next is um, you analyze what you have processed, because not just number crushing alone is making bringing out concrete information out of um, these numbers you have analyzed. Um, next is you communicate what your findings and recommendation. Uh, most times to you, you do a follow up, right? So what are the analytical tools available to you? Um, the most common here is ratios, which um, every one of us having um, written this institute um, exam should be familiar with. So we have ratios, we have the common sizing analysis, we have the graphs, we have the regression analysis. So these are basically tools and techniques that are available to you for financial statement analysis. So for ratios, we, ha we may have a, a, a single or mixed ratio. So when I say single ratio, um, it essentially means that such ratio you can compute it using just one financial statement. For example, your gross profit margin. You can get the information needed to compute this ratio just from the income statements alone. So for mixed ratios are where you have it, you take a variable from, um, let's say, income statement, and you move to balance sheet to pick on that variable in order to arrive um, at the information you are looking for. So have common sizing analysis. I will explain this further when we move to practical analysis using Excel. Then the graphs, you can use this to establish trends. And um, regression analysis, you can use it to establish um, relationship between variables, right? So how is, um, say, let's say, the revenue driving total assets, something of that nature. You could use regression analysis to see if there's any correlation. Um, so other tools available to you to, uh, other quantitative tools you could use. Uh, we have this um, Bushu model and the disease score model. So we all should be familiar with this core model um, uh, from SFM, right? Which uh, we used to predict um, companies going into bankrupt for the next two years. Like, what is the chances of a company going um, becoming insolvent within the next two years? So this is actually a good predictor. Um, when it was developed, it has um, the, it has an um, accuracy of about 72% um, to track companies that would fail within the next two years. And um, although it has a um, type two error, which is it also captures some companies that shouldn't fail, but to after completing this ratio, to actually highlight that yes, those companies which those type two, type two error is about six percent. For pushing models, um, for you to decide if a company is, is manipulating their results, right? So it's called um, above minus one point seven in case that a company is actually managing. Their financial results, which, show, which, which essentially means that financial result does not show a true and fair view. So most of this model, um, just to bring it to your attention, there are some things like this that actually exist. So before you embark on analyzing a financial statement, you can actually just 
um, run the ratios. For Bushi model, you use about eight ratios, while for Cisco model, you use about five ratios. So you can just punch those variables and see if this model are uh, predicting that the companies we, we think within the next two years or they are uh, manipulating their earnings. So that will probably guide you on how you should approach such, um, such numbers. Um, next year, so I'll be discussing these variables we have identified here, our analytical tools. I'll take them one after the other. We'll, look, we'll be looking at ratios and common sizing. So for graphs and regression analysis, we won't be looking at them for today. Um, for ratios, so ratios essentially help us to evaluate past um, performance, assess financial position, and equally gain insight into uh, future um, potential, into future earnings capability of a company. So with, the, with ratios, you could be able to evaluate the operation, operational efficiency of a company, the financial flexibility, changes in industry trends over time, and equally, um, you can equally compare performance across industries. Um, so why what is the common use ratio in financial statement analysis? We have the activity ratios, we have the liquidity, solvency, profitability, and valuation ratios. So I won't spend much time in this. I believe we all should be familiar with some of these, um, uh, if not all of these ratios um, identified here. So moving forward, we we need to have um, just a kind of um, general remark on ratios, right? Why they are useful tools, we should also know that they are not casting stones, right? So you need to apply judgment while using a ratio. Okay, that's one. You need to apply judgment. Second, um, they are also sensitive to end of the period reporting. So anything you, those numbers are telling you may probably not be what it is, especially for balance sheet, because balance sheet just captures just events at the end of the year, just that 31st. Every other day is, every other thing that happens within other reporting days, you, you, you won't be able to have insight on them. So you should actually bear that in mind too. Um, then it's good you evaluate ratios within industry contents. So one, who, who, one of the examples I've used is like current ratio. So current ratio for, I don't even know if there will be any co um, computing current, um, current ratio for a finance institution um, compared to a manufacturing. The interpretation ratio should be interpreted within the context of the business strategy. The business you are analyzing, you should have a, a, a broad understanding of that business and those ratios should be interpreted within their goals and strategy, right? Then industry norms and equally the economic conditions. So as you're analyzing a statement, you don't just um, restrict your focus just for that statement alone. Yeah. You need to equally look at what is happening within the industry um, economy, but that's what informs the company's um, performance. Equally, industry. Uh, in um, so moving down, common sizing analysis. So common sizing, basically, I will demonstrate this using the Excel tool. So when we get there, we'll look at how how could common sizing cost statement the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So we also have horizontal analysis that shows it's just like capturing trend, what has been the structural changes in the business within um, a given period of time. Uh, so we'll, at this point in time, I have to pop up my SL. So we'll look at analysis of income statement. Um, we'll look at um, analysis of balance sheet and equally um, cash flow. So once this SL is up now, this is what we should be looking at. But before I do that, analysis of income statement will actually adopt the three approaches listed here. One is um, common sizing analysis, two is ratio analysis, and three is um, time series, right? Cross um, versus cross sectional analysis. So I will pop up my exam now and demonstrate these stereo analytical tools and how we could use them in analyzing um, income statement. So, a minute, please, let me share my exam file here. Okay, so this this is an income statement. So I'm trying to sorry for the meanings. Okay, so this is an income statement. So I got this data from Nigeria Stock Exchange and this is essentially five years historical performance of Dan Okay, so from twenty fifteen to twenty to twenty nineteen. 
So first of all, we'll be looking at how to common size um, equal statement and equally the information you could derive from it. Like what are the insights you could get from common sizing, which is one of the analytical tools. After which we'll pick one or two ratios and we'll probably look at time um, time series, like trying to establish trend. So what I'm going to do now is this. I've copied these items from revenue down to profits for the year and I'm going to paste it down here. Okay. So we tag this common, common size analysis. Okay, so for common sizing. Okay, fine. So for common sizing of income statement, what we do basically is to use revenue. Revenue, which is the key driver of the income statement, use it to weight every other item of the financial statement, right? So we do revenue um, over revenue for this very year. So we use peak revenue for each year. We use it to common size other items of the financial statement. So how we'll be doing this is this. Um, example is here, revenue. I go up at revenue for 2015 divided by revenue of 2015. Now, since it will be, okay, let me do this. This one, we need it in percentage format. So this is 100%. So since we'll be dragging down, dragging down to get revenue over cost of sales, revenue divided by um, cross profits, um, admin expense, other income, and what I feel down. So what I will do basically is to come back here and lock um, the denominator, which is C B five. So I will lock. I, I want that, that. I want it to remain in this column, which is um, which is five. I want it to remain in five because we are going to drag across. So what we do is to apply a dollar sign on the five. And that is it. So with this, I can comfortably run down book profits for the year. So by the time you go down here, you discover that we still have profit divided by the revenue up. So the revenue, the denominator is constant. They're just feeding at, feeding, looking at revenue numbers, right? So what I'll do now is equally drag it over to populate my Excel sheet. So it's this stands that for every year, you have your revenue divided by an item of the an item of um, each company each item of the financial income statement rather. So for commercializing analysis, what does this help us to achieve, right? So for Dangote Smith Knight accounts for over sixty percent um, market share of the industry. So if I want to look, um, look at Dangote Smith and let's say um, the Bois Smith, which um, accounts for um, um, around twenty percent of the um, market share in Smith industry so will it make sense to compare to be looking at um, um, the absolute numbers let's say cost of sales compared to cost of sales of war was meant that won't make sense so what you should do is by common sizing this financial statement it will allow you to say oh what is the cost um, cost margin of dango testament compared to cost margin of let's say Lafarge or was meant so it gives you a kind of relative basis from which you could be able to compare a very large company and equally a small company and assess how efficient each of them are, right? So looking at this now, we could, um, looking at this, while doing this, we have automatically computed for, um, for some ratios, which for example, gross profit margin has been computed with this on this line automatically it has been computed operating income magic 2 has been computed here and um, profit before tax margin has been computed here too the next thing I would like to draw your attention to is your income tax right so your income tax shouldn't be to you shouldn't be looking at it to revenue because that's not what drives it what drives your income tax is your profit before tax. So actually come here and change this formula to be um, the income tax. You divide by your profit before tax. So that should give you a more holistic picture of what the effective 
tax rate is. So if we currently name this as effective tax, effective tax rate. So, uh, Mr. Oti, Mr. Namdi, hello. I can hear you. Feedback to to be sure that I'm not alone and equally no. everyone is following. No, I, I had to mute. I had to mute you because of the background noise I was hearing. Okay. So um, and I find it difficult to return back to the screen. Okay. Some some somebody said you need to zoom the page a bit. Oh yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I need to be sure that I'm not just in my thing here alone. I don't know if this is okay. I don't know how I can access the chat room at least. I could be seeing some of those comments. You should be able to see. It should be. It should be popping up at your side as well. It should come up in red. Something in red. Look at the right hand side base at the base. You have more okay. more option there. More option. Yeah. That, right. It. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's fine. Now we can see it, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so at this point, I think um, if if you have any question regarding um, common sizing, I think we should be probably posting at the comment box. I can, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the comment, um, comment box right now. So I will address any question. It's clear even with us really not. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, so for common sizing, I think this is it for common sizing. So uh, what other information can you get from common sizing? Because if we actually establish trend to Let's say, for example, in 2015, the cost um, cost of sales margin was 41%. Why in 2016 it increased to 53? So you may want to ask what happened within this year. And equally, if you look at other years, you could see that it has averaged, um, let's say, roughly 43 because 2016 and 20, 2018 and 2019 rather were 43%. Why 2017 was 44? But um, this 2016 is an outlier. Which is 53. Okay, which is what? Um, 53 percent. So, we we'll want to dig for that to see what happened here, right? So, I equally um, extracted just a few notes to the revenue drivers and equally cost of sales. So, let's go to my notes and see what happens. What happened? So, this operating profits. Um, let me see. Uh, these numbers I'm looking at is the same thing as what is here. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, fine. So this number as well is in their cost of sales. So what we could do here equally is to do what? Let's equally common size and see what happens here to, to see what really cost the 2015 cost margin to be higher from other historical numbers. So I'm just trying to give you an insight into what um, common sizing could help you achieve, asking that question of what happened here and trying to get answers to those questions too. So what we do here basically is to commercialize material consumed, to commercialize it by total cost of sales for the year. So we'll do the same trend across um, across other years. Put this to percentage. Take it down. Okay. Since I have some chat on the statement, what is the significance of effective tax rate if computed? Okay, I'll be back to just questions in a moment, please. Okay, so now the, what, what brought us here is actually what we are trying to answer the question of oh, why 53% in 2016 when other years we are um, somewhat average than 43%. So looking at what happened here, we could see that. Let me see this. One looking at this year, looking at 2015 and 2016, you can see that the fuel and power consumed went up this year. So, we want to dig further to ask what caused this. Um, another outlier here is other production expenses, which here was 5%. And we have about 200 basis points increase here to 7%. So, these, these two numbers, um, fuel and power consumed, 
and other operating expenses for you may want to look into them but then before looking into them the question is what's well the materiality right now mm -hmm. if you look at under other production expenses just about 21 21 billion compared to the total of 3 323 billion so that may not be too material but for power and power fuel and power that accounts for about 35 percent is quite material which is even the highest um cost driver for for production so you may want to dig for that to know what happened by looking at the financials so after i think that may be your um the, what everyone should try to if you if you want to analyze for that may probably go and get the annual reports and dig for that to see what happened within this year that caused this spike so moving back to this one asked about the effective tax why do we need to do that right now if you look at what we had initially was revenue let me answer that question very quickly we did tax divide by re revenue Mm. All right. So what we had initially was this. So you could hardly see a trend here because revenue does not does not directly drive drive your tax expense. And you could see that here, which in year in 2015 is one minus one, minus six, eleven, ten, six. There, there is there is there is hardly any trend in this in these numbers. But if you look at what we now did effective tax rate looking at your profit before tax to the tax because your profit before tax though yes accountants will say they're deductibles and stuff but profit before that the tax has more influence on your tax rate to pay for the year and by the time we did you could see that at least we're able to establish a margin somewhat around 20 22 percent unlike these numbers we have here that are just flying up and down on the virus here so i can't hear anything my sound is down daniel i don't know Oh, everyone's complaining that they can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Sorry, please. I can actually hear you. I can hear you from your end. I can hear oh, you. I, 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 I will advise... Um, I can hear to... you. Okay, fine. Fine, that is okay then. Um, okay, so... Um, actually, our main focus, anytime you're analyzing financial statements... Well, it's actually... not loud enough in some cases. It's not loud enough, please. If it's okay, not if it's okay. not loud if it's not loud check your check your speaker side your your speaker settings because I can hear it loud here. Check okay, your... I'll try to I'll try to project, project no, more. For me, it's oh. okay. Okay, well, okay, fine. But hope I'm yes, audible now. Yes. Okay, yeah, fine. You are very very audible. Let right. anyone check it so that end. All right, thank you. So let, let okay, fine, fine. So if we are looking at um, revenue. In cost statement, basically, I think the key driver for us should actually be revenue because that is what shows that the, that is first of all that is a sustainable line for a business, right? So let's say, for example, I've seen some some companies that finance income at ways their revenue, um, some companies other income at ways their revenue. So those lines are equally, I uh, you believe you agree with me that those lines are not sustainable. So while analyzing cost statement, your attention should actually be first on what on revenue what are the key drivers of revenue right so you, you in analyzing revenue there are two companies you should be looking out for one is volume growth right how much is the company able to push out in, in terms of units because that is where the real growth is and secondly you could you should look at price pricing is the pricing going up or coming down okay and in order to have insight into the future prospect of this company you should be asking your questions you should be asking yourself the question of, oh, what is market share of this company? What is happening within that industry? Okay, how how position is the industry given what the current trend in the economy? So I think we'll, we'll, we'll be answering some of these questions now, looking at um, the breakdown of revenue for the advertisement. So equally in my notes to account here, I brought out the the numbers in revenue like revenue nominal values are the quality the units um the sales volume he was able to do within this period now for if you are if you are um familiar with this business you know that he has operation not just in nigeria but also in other african countries right so we're looking at first of all where does he generate majority of his revenue from in nominal terms so to answer that question 
Monopoly want to commercialize again. Now we are still commercializing. So regional revenue. Let's see which country gives gives him the highest um, contribution to revenue. So we we'll do this. Total says we still have to plot this um, and these two. Okay. Okay. Fine. So looking at this number, you can see that Nigeria accounts for at least on the average, this is um, 71% on the average, 71% of um, Zangote Smith's revenue. So if, let's say, we are analyzing um, this statement for, let's say, investment purpose, right? So the question we should be asking, since the majority of his revenue comes from Nigeria, what is the prospect for um, Nigeria economic landscape, right? So um, we may equally want to look at Nigeria's GDP. Okay, what is um, what is um, um, the income distribution in Nigeria? Is it skewed to just let's say one percent of the population up and ninety-nine percent of the population are struggling? What is the median age? Because if you should be having more of, um, youth um, youth population. You, you, you know that those those youth as they are graduating from schools are moving out of their parents' home, there will be demand, there will be increase in housing, right? So, um, which will equally drive new construction activity and Dangote will be able to pull in, pull in more revenue. So, these are some of the key areas we could actually be looking at. What is happening in terms of demographic trend and equally the economic um, capabilities of the, of the country. So, that aside, um, since that is your major revenue drive, if, if, if you are comfortable with the answers you came up with, then fine, we say, oh, going forward, I think that this trend may sustain. Then another key question again is for the pan africa countries, for the pan africa countries that have been lagging uh, averagely around at 1%, what is the cause, right? Is it that there are other competitors out there in the market? Because we know that in Nigeria is the um, industry leader. Uh, what is the quality economic potential is there? Will he be able to build? This Pan Africa countries to at one point in time account for let's say 50% of the revenue, or even be the key major, uh, revenue driver. So, these questions still will equally help you to know where this company is positioned going forward into the future. Um, so, that aside, we have seen the trend and which contributes more. Um, next thing is, um, let me see this. Next thing is look at the volume growth because what we looked at is just the nominal revenue, right? Nominal revenue, which is your unit sell multiplied by your price. So we want to know this growth we have seen now on the revenue in absolute terms from 400 to 800, almost 900 in 2019. What is the driver? Is it just price increases that have been driving it, or he has actually been pushing more volumes out in the economy? So we'll come down here and look at the volume sold per region too. So the same common size analysis here too will probably help us answer some key questions, which I will do here very shortly. And let's see the information we put. We shall out from common sizing is volume growth. So just looking at this number in absolute terms, we we'll probably give you insight too. But by the time you um, common size most of these numbers, actually you have you it, just by me looking at it, you'll we'll be able to answer at least. Key questions that you won't have to strain your eyes too much to um, just, by just looking at the absolute numbers. So, looking at um, the volume growth, you can see a very different picture from what we have seen earlier in absolute um, revenue numbers. Because in absolute, in nominal revenue, you can see that Nigeria was accounting on the average some one percent uh, of, of the of the revenue to the group. But by the time we came back to look at the volume growth, you can see that Nigeria actually. On the average, in volume growth terms, has been accounted for 63%. So, this gives us an insight to oh, probably the volume growth in the price, the revenue contribution from Nigeria may be driven by price increases, right? Rather than volume growth, probably could give us an insight. Or, secondly, could equally point out that oh, yeah, in Pan Africa, he's, he's, he's actually been increasing um, his volume sales there, yeah, but probably he has been taking price discounting to do that. So these questions we can't assign solution without doing any other further analysis, which we'll do very shortly. Because looking at this um, volume growth, you can see that there's a disparity between um, what we have seen in 
absolute revenue numbers and equally in the volume pushed out. So let's look at the price effects across this region and see where it has more of, um, um, will I call it, um, is it bargaining power? Yes. Where he has more of price control. So let's look at that by taking Nigeria and Pan Africa. Yeah, so we'll look at now average prices. Sorry. Average prices, right? So let's see what happens here. So for Nigeria in 2015, it got about 389 billion. We divide it by the unit it did, about 13 million metric tons for Nigeria. Yeah. So this is the average price. Um, okay. So the same thing applies to to Pan Africa. We come down Pan Africa. He did about 103 billion in 2015, and what was the volume he did? He did about 5.6 million metric tons. So let me see. Same format. Fine. So if we see the pricing difference. Now we see the pricing difference between these two, these two countries, right? Now. Yeah, okay, so for Nigeria, we could see that in 20, the average price for Nigeria was around 29,000 Naira for per, per metric tons he ships out. While in Pan Africa, it was um, about 18,000. So, what does this cost to us? Dangote actually has more, more um, pricing power in Nigeria. And you could equally agree with me since it's um, the industry where single player accounts for over 65%. If you, if you believe between that equally, he, he shares that short um, power. So, so we see that why Nigeria has actually been accounting for um, about averagely 70% of its revenue is, is not because of volume. It has actually not done well in volume terms, in price increases. Just for example, if you look at this price increase between um okay let's let's equally do this too let me take this trend analysis here on year let's see what happens what happened in your year um, is minus one now this is showing percentage increase okay yeah this is another insight again now looking at percentage increase in 2016 now they actually lowered price from 29,000 per tons to 28 in 2016. Now the question is what happened in 2016 that led him to lower price? We may, we'll get answer to that shortly. But in 2017, we saw a different, a different board game altogether. Where price were increased by over 54 percent on the average. In 2018, there wasn't price increase. And by 2019, we are we seeing under price discounting, right? But you can see that this jump from 29 to 43 here is massive. So we want to ask the question, what happened within this period that he was able to raise such uh, price increase? So let's look at 2016 first. Now, why starting, why looking at these revenue numbers, as I said earlier, you need to look at the industry trend, right? And not just the industry, what the, what the country is doing too. So what I did there was to bring out our GDP numbers within these years too, and also cement contribution. GDP number in nominal value and array numbers. So, in nominal value is measured at the current price, while the array numbers are measured at constant price. So, our basic economy is anyway. I won't go into details on explaining this. So, for nominal nominal numbers, captures were just the way our revenue here we are captured. Uh, where's that note? So, if we see this as your nominal, right? So this is just in revenue multiplied by your average price, regardless of which is going up or down. But in real time, you're still... I need to send you the recording. Huh? I need to do that with the police. I don't record. I don't have to use my data. Victor, please, can you mute yourself? Even the one where I they get one for one day. Thank <laughs> you.
Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? I've actually unmuted myself. I think when meeting our participants, I was erroneously muted. So, okay, fine. So, let's look at what happened within the have been growing so sluggishly. Now, what pr brought us here initially was this question of oh, what led to this fall and the next uh, very sharp increase. So since Nigeria went into recession in, 20, in 2016, um, you could see, you could agree with me that any economy that is in recession, the last thing businesses want to do is to expand capacity because they're um, heightened the certainty within the economy. So what happened here is that we we'll say, oh, probably there wasn't much volume increase in 2016. And we could see that by looking at oh, volume space we are even up here. OK, so why the price increase? Probably he did price discounting to motivate people to buy more of his product. Since um, the economy was depressed, uncertainties and people, everybody would want to hold on on, cap on CapEx to see what happens going forward, to at least get some clarity on economic direction before investing again. So Paulie said that, that is what explains the price discounting we saw here. And immediately the economy recovered in 2017 by just 0.83%. You could see the, the sharp jump in, in what is it called? In the average, in the, in, in, in the prices. So that was 54% drop in prices. So the discount he took here because the economy was slowing down, he probably quickly got, the comp got compensated here. Now, another issue now about economic recession is that in economic recession, government tends to do what? Spend more in order to stimulate aggregate demand and quickly um, re um, revive the economy. So we could equally say that probably the capital expenditure and backed by the government within that year in order to stimulate the economy then got have been the um, market supply equally contributed significantly. And based on that power, he took the opportunity to equally uh, ramp up prices quickly so he could offset for other lost revenue and stuff. So neither way, just looking at these numbers, you could actually be able to oh, be making inferences here and there and equally know what the company would be able to do going forward. So we have spent a lot of time in revenue. This is um, about 45 minutes gone. So I'll quickly um pop up my slide again let's move to balance sheet so this is how far we can go in revenue revenue analysis i'm just trying to give you an insight what you should be looking at so equally actually brought us main contribution to gdp to what men do with the period and we see that in 2016 that it went it went down too so this should actually tell you oh if you want to invest into this company too what the state of the economy matters to if the economy in boom is it is it recessionary or is he at the recovery stage? So at every point in time, present a different opportunity for this uh, for the for the company. Um, having said that, I can't actually exhaust all I uh, all I could want to say in analysis of people's statements. So that notwithstanding, let's move forward for the sake of time. So now I'll be popping up my slide again. Let's look at how we could analyze balance sheets and um, share screen. Okay, let me. Bring in my slide. Um, let's see. 
share or perfect. So for income statement, at least we were able to at least touch, although we didn't touch much of the ratios, but with that common size, we were able to see gross profit margin of retained income and net profit margin and equally time trend, although um apply equally imported one or one other cement company. So for each other look at oh within this player who is the more more efficient, but at least with this um who have dropped in for commercializing analysis and ratio, you can actually take it further on your own to see how comparing um, both companies which is more efficient and um, um who is doing more in what place and who and who is in what in, in the other place, right? Um so at this point let's move to this slide is not moving. Okay, yeah. Oh yes. So um in equal statement actually we're analyzing equal statement. I think our major our major um is it our key attention should be on profitability, right? Revenue and profitability. Now analyzing cost statement, there is a um there is a key ratio here that looks at um profitability of a company, which is your return on equity. So on the account terms, I think you could use this as a your return return on something. I don't uh, let me see profit profit before interest and tax something of this nature divided by your shareholders fund. Okay, I think this is, this is the formula essentially you could use, but that formula can actually be broken down into into this. Okay, into the tax burden, interest burden, um, the a bit margin, total asset turnover, and your financial leverage. So what this formula does essentially is to highlight the weak point across um, drivers of profitability for a company. So the weak point may be coming that, oh, this company is exposed to a higher tax charges, or the company has a lot of debt, so the interest burden is weighing on, on that company, or the company, this is the process for cash flow, right? This a bit, because, uh, so what prosy just that you have a depreciation and amortization. So this can actually measure your operating efficiency to your distribution and admin expenses. How efficient are you on those line items? This is where you could get a skincare insert on. The next is your sales to asset. Do you have that asset that you're not using? Now, if you look at Nango Testament, he has um, about three plans, but funny enough, you have about 45 um, 45 um, capacity, uh, metric tons capacity in Nigeria, but it's actually using about 50%. So you may say, oh, since he's just using about 50%, by the time he deploys, let's say 80 to 90% of that capacity, you could actually see, be able to um, return more, um, generate more return for shareholders. And you could actually look at leverage too. And leverage, and uh, with this ratio, you could see that leverage is not bad for a, a defensive business, right? A business that is defensive is not exposed to cyclical swings. You could see that leverage could actually be a very good um, a very good profit and booster for such a business. For so example, in, in analyzing financial services, um, this is actually two key ratios. In fact, this um, ROE thing was this actually the the two key ratios for me you should be looking at right. But by the time you do you do your return your sales on assets and your asset on equity so this gives you your leverage factor so on on the hand side why i would normally say that if you could um return let's say four percent on or rather this should be pat pat over asset because by the time you start cancelling out this on arithmetic this becomes um pat over your asset multiplied by your leverage factor so just these two number alone could tell you where a business could be. A business that is, that is highly efficient and could be able to return, let's say, somewhat between four to five percent on um, on assets and have a leverage factor of about um, five to six percent to comfortable return and ROE year on year of about 25, 28 percent. So you could, you could actually play with this number and see. But at every point in time, I pick up a financial to to analyze. This is the kind of litmus test I would do. Oh. What, what are you returning on, on your asset and what is the leverage factor? So, for, as I said again, for defensive business that are not exposed to cyclical swing, this could, the leverage factor could actually be a profit booster for such business. Whereby, they are, what, what it means essentially is that you are using minim, um, the BRS minimum equity to, to drive returns to shareholders. 
So I won't say that you may actually need to play with numbers to have a feel of what, what this can do for you. But it's actually a very key ratio in eco statement analysis. So let's look at analyzing balance sheets, right? So I said initial balance sheet shows you the resource of an entity and how it's being financed. Is it financed by equity or liability, a combination of both, and in what proportions too? So analyzing a cost statement, we still maintain the term trend we have seen before, which is one common sizing analysis. We'll look at ratios and cross-sectional analysis. So briefly, we'll go down to look at those. But before then, there are equally key ratios we could look at um, for balance sheet. Though we may not be looking at some of these social because there are things I believe we should know, which is the big um, ratio, asset test, and cash. So this, this points to liquidity of the business. How liquid is that business meeting short-term obligations? And the higher these ratios, the better, the more comfort you have as, um, as an investor, whether, whether investing in equities or debt. Next is solvency ratio, uh, which shows um, ability of that company to meet what long-term obligation. So for solvency ratio will be very key for cyclical businesses that are, that, that are exposed to swing. Let's say the way the economy, just like hotels now, you could, believe, you could agree with me that any hotel that is highly leveraged within this period is in, is in big trouble um, due to the lockdown policy and, and stay at home stuff. So uh, in, interest on, on what they call the interest on those like this is the coupon region and the person will, without generating any revenue, will equally run it into troubles. So um, solvency ratio will actually point in on your financial, highlight financial risk for such company and how much leverage is being used to finance the assets. So the lower this ratio, um, the better. Um, so I haven't said that before I pop up my exercise sheet. Like, well, so I, now, um, analyzing balance sheet will help you answer um, basically liquidity concerns and probably how capital is being deployed for that business. So apart from liquidity and solvency, you can actually use it to assess what funding need of the business too. So for those in banks that do with credit, so when the companies approach you that, oh, I want to take up um, loan is this short term or long term so most companies find it very difficult telling you oh this is what i need they may say they, they, they may be demanding for a short term loan why in the actual sense what they need is actually a long term loan so we could be able to look at the numbers and decipher which um which of these they should go for whether short or, or whether short or um or long and equally the combinations too okay so I haven't said that, let me pop up my Excel and show you how you could be able to do some of these basic things I've said here. Um, so I'm going back to our, yes. So hope I have my Excel projecting now, right? Can I have a response on that? If you can zoom it a bit. Okay. Okay, yeah, zoom yeah. it, zoom it. Okay, fine. I think this is fine, right? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, fine. So on our assets, asset side, we could look at common sizing first. Let's start with that. So basically, assets, as we all know, we have our non-current, we have our current, and the combinations of the two gives us our total assets. For, like, for equity, we have equity, and we have... Um, short and long time liabilities and at the end of the day La liabilities total equity and liability so we should be commercializing this right now to see to see the distribution of the total assets right bear in mind that this is a manufacturing company and um, production capacity is actually key for such a business so we should be looking at the distribution of assets to be able to be able to Makes sense if this company is actually post them um, to deliver actual returns. So what should be doing as usual is um, our PPE. So for commercializing in in balance sheet, you use total assets to commercialize every other item of the financial statement. So I'll be doing PPE divided by our total asset, which is here. As usual, I'll have to lock it um, inside twenty in order not to. Not to move those numbers, right? So to do this, I'll just drag down. Okay. So before I drag down, I just thought about something now. 
if I drag them down, I'll be having errors in some places like this. Okay, something like zero. Oh, fine. Yeah, no problem. Let's drag down then and see what happens. This is like this very quickly. Asset total asset and PP of total asset. So with this, I think we are good to go. So first first of all, we know that our balance sheet for asset side is categorized into two categories. Like once we, one we have our non-current and we have our current. So if we want to see the asset distribution, now this total asset. Now what is this yeah, asset? Yeah. What is the asset? So to see what is the asset distribution for a non-current asset and for current. So for non-current, we consider is more skewed towards not current. So we have 80 down and it's coming down to um, 77. So this is expected because it's a manufacturing um, company. And also, one thing you need to mind is that for non current, there are no two liquid assets, right? So you need to have that in mind too. Why looking at these numbers now? Uh, we could see that we have um, this asset on, um, skewed towards the non current. Now, non current, which of this non current accounts for the significant? Uh, portion of this asset, which is the PPE. So PPE here within non current accounts for um, of total balance share account for about 60, 69 percent, um, rough on the average. We we'll have about 73, yeah, 73 percent. So this is actually good for a manufacturing company, and this gives you comfort that yes, but the other test should be this asset. This asset here are they productive? So that should be another question you should, you should ask yourself. Which we have said initially, looking at the volumes they have, they have been able to ship out. And if what I told you that the company is operating at 50% capacity, which means they still have rooms to go. They have actually invested for the future, which means as people keep on um, building houses, demanding for, for more means, the company, without um, expanding current existing capacity, will be able to meet the future demand. So looking at current asset, we can see that current asset is somewhat skewed around 20%, which is expected. And within this current asset, we expect the inventory should account for more of this current asset. We actually have inventory and prepayment too. So we may want to know why is it paying in advance for. So you can look at the notes in account for those prepayments and know what the company is paying for in advance. Or the payment they are receiving, rather, this what they are receiving. So customers may actually be paying even before the ships means to them, right? So I would say that next is to look at our our equity. So what proportion of funding for this total asset is coming from equity? You can see by about 50% of our funding is coming from equity. So the company is structured towards 50% equity, 50% debt. So which may show that the company is actually not too really leveraged. So this is what commercializing will actually, um, the insight to act it will actually generate for you while looking at um, the company's balance sheet. So without wasting further time, let's see. So for leverage, um, next question you should be asking is, oh, since the company is funding about 50% from equity, what portion, the automatically 50% should be coming from debt. But is it now long-term debt or short-term debt? We see that on non-current, for non-current asset borrowings accounts for about, it has actually been declining, so we show that the company has actually been leveraging rather than taking on further debt. So that is what it shows here. And they are borrowing composition. They have more of long term. OK, they have more of short term than long term. Because if you look at the long term here, it has actually been going up from 4% here. It has gone up to 14. While for long term, from 19, it has gone down to 6. So you may ask why has this short term borrowing increased as to long term? OK. so. These are possible questions that you may that you may find answers to. Um, so let's see. So next year again is um, the payables. So while the company has about fifty percent funded by debt, about sixteen percent 
of that debt is actually free, interest free, because your trade payable is uh, what your supplies um, credit from some from suppliers, right? So those credit um, is actually like advances. They just come to you, and when you have money, you go and pay them back. So he's actually using out of that fifty percent, is solely not on interest bearing debt. We have about sixteen percent, which whereby we are left with about what um, that's four percent that is um, that may be interest interest bearing. So that is equally a very good pointer for this business. So next thing we should be looking at is how you could. So with this, you could compare your normal ratio of debt to equity. Um, that's the total asset, equity total asset, and what I view. So I'm going to do that. But next thing I would like to draw our, our attention to is the funding. How to assess for um, for credit, let's say funding it of a company, right? So if you look, look at this asset asset distribution, the PPE. Um, so for funding, normally in what is it called? In a Counting, you should say that your long term debt should go for should fund your long term assets and your short term fund rather should go for current. So what we should be looking at is this for total non current assets, right? Which is a long term asset. What proportion of liabilities, both equities and debt, are long term, and how are they able to match those long term funds? Okay, so what, what what we we can actually do here is to say, um, let me just bring down these numbers. So I'll just do it without adjusting for anything. Okay, I'll just run through this number without making for any adjustment. But in real life, you have to adjust for things like tax, different taxes that have no. They are not real per se. Um, non current. We have non current here, right? So this non current normally should be funded by. Should be funded by equity and long term debt. So what is the shareholders' equity here? This is a way to actually assess for funding need of business. Okay, so long term there should be borrowings on non current assets, which is here. Yep. Borrowings plus long term payables. We can add this. To. This is a long term in nature. Okay, so we can total this and call them. This is actually what we have available to fund our long term assets. Um, we we'll do. We'll do this. So, what is the difference? Are we having a funding? This normally should fund, should fund this. So if we see that to the extent at which this long-term fund do not meet your um, non-current assets, that is short for that is coming from a, a fund mismatch actually. So we show that this company is actually using some short-term um, fund to fund the proportion of their long-term assets. So there may be a funding a funding mismatch here. So if such companies should approach you for let's say for loan. You should actually tell them that oh yes, why we think and and it is actually where explanatory. If you look at what has the trend that has happened within this um, borrowing, it's long term borrowings which has gone down sharply, and rather the short term borrowing here. If you look at the common sizing analysis, so this actually highlighted that here, borrowings have declined from 19 long term borrowing from 19 to 6, while short term borrowing on the other hand here has actually gone up. Okay. Has actually gone up, so we shows that the company is actually using some of the short-term funds to fund what to fund long-term assets. So this is a funding need, a long-term, a long-term what 
funding need. So let's look at working capital after which I think I'll call it a go on this. So for working capital need, so we have our current asset, total on current asset here. Um, we have total current asset here. Okay. Then current asset normally should be funded by first the cheapest source of um, funding, which is actually your trade payables, because this is the most desirable because there's no cost attached to it, right? So every business wants to as much as possible fund most of their operation from um, credit advances from their suppliers because it comes at no cost. So where this unable to fund it, you now have to go and say, oh, let me start borrowing. But the first call of action is that, oh yeah, this should be able to, this should be able to fund for, to cover for your um, capital needs. So to the extent is not able to cover for it, that is one of our calls for borrowings. So we'll do this. Um, okay. So this is also short term funding need. So you can see with this, at least you are able to establish two. And to establish that, oh, this, this company may need um, long term funding to this proportion, although I haven't made no adjustments. Because in real life, the other adjustment we have made, but um, I, I would say that is beyond, beyond the scope of what I'm for now. And the short term funding to yes, the the business we need short term funding to this proportion. But by the time we bring in, we will not bring in short term borrowings here, yeah, the overdraft and so these are probably is above what we have here. Um, let me do that quickly. Other borrowing, we have our our bank overdraft and short term borrowing. So by the time I bring this two together. So we see that what we have identified actually, um, we can see that this need we have identified here, short term it has actually been accounted for for the borrowings. Okay, so on yes. So um, this is the extent at which the payables is unable to fund current current um, current liability, right? Current asset rather. So that short for has actually, they have actually make it up by borrowing more. Okay, so and this is the extent at which um, we now have working capital, working capital available. And some of this working capital is actually what is now going into funding the long-term funding need. So this this company going forward will actually need a, a long-term fund to sustain this business. I will actually see that if you, if you have been following um, Dango this much, you, you should realize that recently, I think uh, last month, it came out to raise a bond, so which is um, a long-term um, bond, right? So that may be to address this um, shortfall we have seen in the previous year. So that is it for balance sheet and what you could actually information request for balance sheet. So a brief summary, you can, from balance sheet, you can assess the liquidity need of the company, the solvency, and actually their funding need too. Now their funding need, is it efficient or is it working long-term fund deficient or short-term fund deficient. So for those in, in credit, this could actually be a very insightful um, analysis for them. So let's move forward to cash flow. So I'll stop sharing this. Let's go back to my share to my slide. Yep. So that is it for this. So let's look at cash flow. So basically for cash flow, our attention should be, oh, first, how much is the company generating in terms of operating activities? Then is operating activities able to fund their investing and financing activities? Your operating activities normal day-to-day -day running of the business. 
So if most of the funds or funding from operating activity is able to cover for investing and financing, the company is good. But in, in sometimes, depending on the life cycle, the life cycle, cycle stage of that business too. So for a mature, yeah. For a mature, yeah? Okay, um, let me see. I'm actually not seeing the chat. All right, fine. So for every company, okay. Okay, so for for cash flow analysis, our main attention should actually be for for uh, on on operating uh, cash flow generated from operations. So even though now we stand, you should actually bear in mind what um, stage of growth is the company. If it's actually a company that has just gone into the market, you know that should be doing more of investment and stuff. So probably they should be having more of um, more of um, investing activity, more of their cash flow going into investing activities, and even more financing operation. Um, um, more financing to so come into investing activity. So for a mature company, you should expect that their operating activity should be able to take care of the other to be low. So depending on at what stage of growth a company is, you should have that um, as a yardstick while looking at um, the cash flow position of that company. So for cash flow, I think it doesn't go beyond looking at the cash distribution, where is the major source, in, um, source of cash flow, and where is it going back to. Are they using it to pay down debt? Are they distributing it to investors in form of dividends? Or are they equally um, um, investing? That is raising um, production um, capacity from where it is currently. So I haven't said that. I'll be moving next. I don't think there will be any analysis in this. So cash flow statement basically is this is what I've said before. So you need to know the key driver for operating cash flow, key driver for investing, and the key driver for financing too. Um, so what are the relationship between this financial statement, right? So you, you, while analyzing a financial statement, we may like to look at the growth rate of assets of the sales, then a growth rate of asset, total asset too. Are they growing in, ta in, in a tandem or is there any disparity? So anyone that is growing faster than what, you should actually dig further to their credit and explanation. Next is the operating income and the and the um, operating um, in profit too. So the profits, what percentage of profit actually translate to real cash for the business? So a business may actually be doing more sales, but it's actually pushing through receivables, which is credit, it's rather cash. So looking at these two relationships, your net profit and operating cash flow will actually and give you an insight into what exactly is driving the growth of that business. And if you believe it means that those that are doing more of, um, what is it called? more receivables, more credit, they only run the risk of not being able to realize most of those um, credit advances to, um, to, to their customers. So that is a significant risk for such companies too. Next is inventory and receivables here, which will actually give you how the company is able to drive um, the volume sales, the revenue they are getting. So I think that should be the end. I, I should be available on taking questions. Um, I've actually been talking about this one, no feedback. So, so I think that's all. I'm open for questions now. I think Mr. Nnamdi can actually unmute the participant now. Or I don't know how you can answer here. Thank you yeah, so much. Has... Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Frank Namka. You've done justice to this uh, this topic, and uh, I really, on behalf of the page platform uh, moderators, I want to say a very big thank you to you, and uh, also on behalf of the participants. Now, this time for questions, but before then, I would like you to participants to know that there's a, a link we are sharing down there in the question section uh, in, the, in the chat box. That link is for the attendance sheet. So, kindly fill it up a few minutes so that we can, we can uh, have an email where we can send you the materials, if any, and the links for the videos. Then, uh, this is time for questions. So, if you have a question, just uh, flag. Or you can send the message through the chat box, the chat uh, tool, 
or you raise your hand and uh, we call you out so, so you ask questions. Question time, question time. Ready to answer questions. Uh, I, sent my, I sent in my observation. Okay. The, the, on this, the funding needs. On the funding the needs. Where did you send it, please? Uh, the chat box, but uh, I think that I sent it to him privately. Okay, sent it to him privately. It was okay. like a comment. It was like a comment. Okay. Uh, there was something I wanted him to look at. When I was asking question about um, tax, yes, whether adjustments were taken care of, because I would let we are looking at absolute figure of tax. Otherwise, one would expect that the profit figure we should be looking at uh, before determining tax, is there should be a disclosure of the profit before depreciation. That was the first observation that I made, but he, he responded to it, but I, 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 I felt that I should just mention that. Oh. Unless we are looking at absolute figure of tax on the statement, which most times might be misleading because a lot of adjustments go into taxation. When there you don't have any, it's just depreciation that you're adding back. So Frank? Yes. Um, I don't know if I should respond to that. Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. so um, for tax, basically, I think what he's pointing to is um, the effective tax rate, right? Yes. Yes? Yes. You have computed my effective tax rates. Oh, yeah. So, look, look, looking at you know um, how like the software to take this. Okay, now, actually, in, in, in real life, when you're doing this analysis, right, there are, there are actually so many adjustments that goes into it because you won't just look at the tax figures and just pick it that way. And equal in the, what is it called, to, in the note to account, too, there's breakdown of the tax and additional information on tax actually so what i just did basically just on the hand side right once you pick up your financials and you do this so if there's any major alteration or less an outlier that now when you're doing that common size what effectively i just recognize let's say a significant deviation or you're trying to establish a trend so if there's any significant outlier, that should not prompt you to oh let me look deep further into this and know why is that way so what we just did here is not actually like a casting stone that everyone has to go approach it um, towards this way, towards okay. this way or something. Yeah. Okay. So there are actually other adjustments, just like the funding need I did too. I thought in real life there are actually other adjustments that will have gone through that. But okay. let, just, let, let me just narrow down my question too. I, okay. I just wanted to find out, is uh, yes. the, the tax value, is it really a relevant item in the analysis of... Um, uh, in the income statements. Yes, it is. Because if you look at this um, DuPont I, analysis... I, I, and except, for instance, that it affects your cash flow. And yeah, the cash flow yeah, needed yeah. the subsequent year. How okay. relevant is it? Okay, yeah. So, for, 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 for some companies, let me use banks for example. Okay, so we knew what is going on within the banking sector, right? So, let's say when... Um, some some months back, let's say last year, when yield on treasury be uh, risk free was around eighteen percent, right? So I don't want to mention names here, but some banks had about one trillion naira sitting in just treasury be alone. What yeah. other banks be pursuing? Well, um, that that will be earnings now. That will be earnings. The taxation yeah, is determined by the profitability, the business yeah. yielded in the year. So let me land, right? Okay. So, so many companies, I know, I know of a bank that has over one trillion sitting on treasury bill alone. And that is risk, that is risk free one, and it's not taxable. Now, other companies that are busy creating risk assets at 23%, 26%, actually have to pay tax on that, right? And those, those companies, that, those banks that get towards chasing, creating risk assets, that is loan, advancing loan. Customer is actually helping the economy, but other ones that are investing in treasury, which is risk free, are doing that free of charge. 
and they are not they are not faced with any risks because government let's say we assume that government won't default. So when analyzing such company now, I can when you look at their tax burden now, okay, you may look at the ROE for a company that is investing in treasury bill alone and is not insuring tax compared to a company that is creating risk asset that you have with trading tax and whatever going into those 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 components, right? So at the end of the day. Since that um, interest income is, is um, 